Esteemed guests, presidents, rectors, authorities, academics, students, signatories of the Magna Carta Universato, Universitato, sorry. It is my privilege and sheer pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the whole community of my university and the organizers of this year's Magna Carta Universitatum Anniversary, a, a first for Poland. It seems only fitting that the University of Łódź should host this event having been one of just 11 Polish higher education institutions to sign the original Magna Carta back in 1988 with the Iron Curtain still firmly in place. One might say that the inclusion of Eastern Bloc universities in that initiative was one of the first gusts of the wind of change that brought on major transformation in Europe soon thereafter. The wind keeps on blowing, the changes are for the better and for the worse, and thus the world of 2023 is different from that back in 1988. But the values that guide academia should remain unchanged. This is Magna Carta's greatest strength, universality and untemporality, resistance to trends, fads and political preferences. Another reason why Magna Carta has attracted nearly a thousand universities worldwide is that the values it upholds are not restricted to the ivory tower, but have a very practical axiological dimension. Universities are exceptionally large communities of those disseminating and seeking knowledge and truth, communities that coexist and integrate with society. The theme of this year's event is the reconstruction of cities. And as we know all too well, our eastern neighbor has been at war with the Russian aggressor for nearly two years now. We have here with us guests from Ukraine, whose cities, whose universities will require painstaking reconstruction. We have demonstrated our support to your cause from day one, and it continues unwavering. University of Łódź, from the first day of the war, hosted in its dormitories over 600 Ukrainians, mostly mothers, brothers, and sisters of our Ukrainian students. But as the wind of change blows everywhere, a pleasant breeze on some occasions, a devastating hurricane on others, wars are unfortunately waged in multiple locations. The Israel-Palestine conflict has recently escalated in Gaza and already cost thousands of lives. Academia is apolitical but is not immune and never indifferent. We all help whenever we can and help we must. It is not just armed conflict, natural disaster, climate change, adverse demo demographic and economic effects are among the topics of this conference and the concerns of academia 
communities worldwide. I think the Magna Carta Observatory for conferring the honor of organizing this year's anniversary event upon University of Łódź, as all the other signatories, we uphold, implement, and advance the key values of the Carta. Independence, seamless, seamless coexistence of teaching and research, as well as tolerance and openness to di dialogue. I'm certain that these values will not only reverberate many times over the next three days in the University of Łódź, but have already become the guiding principles in the day-to-day -day operation of all our universities. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask Mr. David Locke, Secretary General of Magna Carta Observatory, to take the floor. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Rector, dear Rectors, dear Signatories, may I extend on behalf of the Magna Carta Council the warmest of welcomes to you to watch. And may my first words be words of thanks to Madam Rector and to all of her colleagues at this university for hosting us, for the excellent arrangements, for the perfect venue for the theme of our conference. And may I pay tribute to her amazing colleagues who have welcomed us today and have facilitated this event. And also her colleagues and herself as a member of the steering group for this event. And let me just join Marcin, Carla, uh, with those thanks, and also Anna, who has done a huge amount to help put this together. You will know that in the Magna Carta 2020, the new element is a statement of responsibility uh, to society. And that has been very greatly in evidence through the generosity which universities have shown towards universities in Poland over the last 18 months and particularly from Ukraine. And it's therefore fitting that as part of this event, we will have the opportunity to hear firsthand from colleagues in Ukraine and Poland, and we will hear from them both formally from this platform and informally during our networking reception this evening. Also, you're going to be working quite hard over the next three days um, because we will be celebrating student successes. We have with us the five winners of our first essay competition to whom we will present awards on Wednesday and they will be reading their essays tomorrow and that will be broadcast from which to the world. We will also um, be signing with the Global Student Forum a memorandum of understanding on Wednesday to put to another level our association with them. There will be th 34 more universities signing the Magna Carta and we will welcome them most warmly on Wednesday. And also, you will have your chance to have your say on the future work of the Magna Carta Observatory. 
there will be a World Cafe table where we will be in listening mode because we will be setting our stat strategy for 2025 to 2030 and we want your input. So I look forward very much to working with you over the next uh, three days and it's now my pleasure to hand the floor to Lukas who will make some announcements and take us through the first session. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary-General, David. Um, before we proceed to the first item on the agenda, the first panel, um, may I have your attention for a moment for some um, technical organizational um, things. As you've figured out by now, uh, your badges have a QR code where you will find the program of the conference, which is being updated. You can connect to the conference Wi-Fi using the login and password provided on the back of your badge, which is MCO, the login, and the password is Magna Carta, of course, with a CH 2023. As the conference is being broadcast live, um, please avoid using the uh, central aisle here in the room, so if you have to leave the room or move elsewhere, please uh, stick to the side aisles if possible. Um, if you haven't done so already, please provide the uh, staff at registration with uh, the name of your hotel. We will provide transport, um, however, only to and from the hotels listed on the conference website. Of course, we are here um, to help you, so if you have any questions, uh, please approach me or any um, one from the organizers. So much for the organizational information, and uh, if it's okay, I'll proceed directly to the panel, which is titled Regional Perspectives on University Serving Societies, Challenges and Response. So in this pre-conference session, we will be providing an introduction to the higher education landscape and current issues, both in Poland and in Ukraine, and uh, the speakers who have agreed to speak today are either online or physically here with us. Thank you uh, all, whether you are online or here, for sharing with us your ideas and uh, experience connected with um, the higher education landscape in Poland or in Ukraine. The first speaker is online, and the first speaker is uh, president of the Conference of Rectors of Academic Schools in Poland, CRASP. May I introduce Professor Arkadiusz Mężyk. Professor, if you are with us here online, the floor is now yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you for the invitation to this conference uh, on behalf of the Conference of Rectors of Academic schools uh, in Poland, CRASP, I'm very pleased to address this extremely important issue. Nowadays, a lot is being said about the crisis of uh, cities which are depopulating, struggling with urban and social problems. At this point, uh, we should stress that a modern city is often a metropolis, which is a much more complex organism. I am particularly familiar with this because I live and work in a metropolitan region of Upper Silesia in Gliwice, a city whose modern identity was created mainly by the Silesian University of Technology and Katowice Special Economic Zone. The capital of our region, Katowice, has undergone a transformation over the past decades. From a city associated with heavy industry, air pollution, environmental degradation, Katowice has become a center of culture, science and education, as well as a modern center for business and new technologies. The former Katowice mine has been transformed into the culture zone, a place unique not only in Poland, 
but also in Europe. Among other things, Katowice was awarded the title of European City of Science 2024. This was possible through the synergy of local government with science and the efforts of the academic consortium formed by the city and seven public universities. The city of Łódź has a similar experience of transforming brownfield sites and those threatened by the population. The long period of transformation is being turned into a success story for the city. The scientific and educational trends of Polish universities is very high and their influence on the changes ta taking place in the country is enormous, although often underestimated. Looking from the global perspective of CRASP, in the present academic year, more than 1.2 million students started their studies in more than 350 Polish higher education institutions. Among them, over 100,000 foreigners study in our country, with the largest group being from Ukraine. When thinking about the task of the university, we should also relate to the current difficult geopolitical situation in the world and the social responsibility of science. Academic institutions should foster a sense of meaning in life and a sense of security through very good education the popularization of reliable knowledge and scientific achievements, the integration of the academic community and stronger involvement of the community members in activities to enhance security as a common good. A university must inspire, encourage and attract young people. Companies and business are willing to establish their headquarters in the vicinity of universities, which become a natural resources of well-educated staff. We notice that businesses influence not only the employment perspective, but also affects the educational offer, supporting and profiling it directly or indirectly according to market trends. The influence of universities on the dynamics of development and the growth of the country's intellectual and technolo technological potential is enormous. The role especially increases when we are dealing with the consequences of such tragic events as those unfolding across our eastern border. Universities are the driving force behind the transformation of the region. Cooperation between Polish and Ukrainian universities should already be aimed at the development of academic centers, reconstruction and European integration in Ukraine. The CRASP has strongly supported Ukraine, especially in its integration into the European higher education area and the European research area. The integration friendly activities are supposed to lead to partnership relations between Polish and Ukrainian universities and national rectors conferences. On the results is expected to be the inclusion of the Union of Rectors of Ukrainian Institutions of Higher Education into the European University Association. We will also uh, intensively support the accession of Ukrainian universities to different international organizations, increasing the participation of Ukrainian universities in the Erasmus Plus program the reconstruction of damaged university infrastructure and the restoration of university activities. Not only does the war affect the condition of Ukraine's universities, but the omnipresent sense of danger to life takes a toll on the mental health of young people, university applicants and students. 
Despite uh, changing uh, life profiles and limited mobility, many continue their studies abroad. According to published data, around 48,000 students from Ukraine were studying at Polish universities last year, and the total cost incurred by universities and institutes to support refugees exceed 4 million euros. Since the beginning of the war, the support has covered not only approximately 10,000 refugees, but also current students, doctoral students or employees. To better organize the support for Ukraine at the beginning of March 2022, on the initiative of the CRASP with the financial support of the Ministry of Education and Science, a network of coordinators for Ukraine assistance was established. It brings together representatives of 229 entities, universities, institutes of Polish Academy of Sciences, representatives of the ministry, government, government agencies and other organizations. We are convinced that soon higher education and vibrant research and innovation centers will play an important role in the recovery of the Ukrainian economy from the devastation of the war and Ukraine's membership in the European Union. We want to continue to be actively involved in this process. Thank you very much. I wonder if, okay, it should work now. Sorry. Thank you very much, Professor Nenzik, for these insightful words. We will now hear an equivalent perspective of U Ukraine. The next speaker is uh, also online, and he is president of the Union of Rectors of Universities of Ukraine, Professor Petro Kulikov. Professor, if you are with us, the floor is yours. Welcome. Good morning, Вітаю всіх учасників конференції під імені співдиректорів України. Дякую за запрошення та можливість висказати свою думку про перспективи повоєнного відновлення та розвитку міст України, роль університетів у трансформації сучасних міст через освіту та дослідження. Запинися. Can you hear us? I welcome all the participants of the conference on behalf of the Union of Rectors of Ukraine. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to express my opinion on the prospects of post-war recovery and development of Ukrainian cities, the role of universities in the transformation of modern cities through education and research. Yeah, absolutely. Щодо співпраці між українським і польськими університетами, і сподіваюся, що так воно і буде, і я думаю, що це на користь наших країн. I support uh, what Professor Menjik said about uh, the uh, perspectives of uh, coordination of Polish and Ukrainian uh, haze uh, in business of uh, reconstruction of uh, Ukraine after the, the Russian invasion. Першою тезою моєї доповіді є необхідність визначення ролі університетів у повоєнному відновленні міст України через комплекс історичних, культурних, демографічних, географічних та економічних факторів. Сукупність цих факторів остаточно буде сформована повоєнна конфігурація політичних відносин, економічних зв'язків та матеріальних факторів виробництва. The first thesis of my report is the need to define the role of universities in the post-war recovery of Ukrainian cities through a set of historical, cultural, demographic, geographical and economic factors. The combination of these factors will be finally shaped by the post-war configuration of political relations, economic relations, and material factors of production. Що таке сучасне місто? Це місто сучасних людей, які формують запит на 
заміни в міському середовищі. Роль університету – сформувати покоління таких людей та надати їм можливість постійного особистого, особистого розвитку. Що є a modern city? A modern city is a city of modern people who form a demand for change in the urban environment. The role of the university is to form a generation of such people and provide them with the opportunity for continuous personal development. Розвиток міста та освіти під час війни складна справа. Розвиток міста та освіти після війни це надскладна справа. Країни Європи пройшли цей шлях відновлення після Другої світової війни, і кожна країна своїм шляхом йшла. Інтеграція вашого досвіду надає нам надію та натхнення. The development of the city and education during the war is a complicated matter. The development of the city and education after the war is an extremely complicated matter. European countries have traveled this path of recovery after the Second World War, each country in its own way. The integration of your experience give us hope and inspiration. На перший план у повоєнному відновленні та розвитку міст України постає вирішення проблем освітньої логістики, моделювання структури та змісту університетських центрів України та визначення загальної стратегії їх інтернаціоналізації та включення до європейського освітнього простору. Ми вже з вами у розумінні цінностей освіти та академічних свобод, але маємо тільки частину доступних європейським університетам можливостей. In the post-war reconstruction and development of Ukrainian cities, the first priority is to solve the problems of educational logistics. To model the structure and content of university centers in Ukraine and to define a general strategy for their internalization and inclusion in the European educational space. We are together with you in understanding the values of education and academic freedom, but we have only a part of the opportunities available to European universities. Академічною та науковою спільнотами, крупним та середнім бізнесом, місцевими органами влади та місцевою громадою ми знайдемо шляхи ефективного використання наукового та кадрового потенціалу українських університетів у формуванні якісного міського середовища, яке буде однозначно відповідати стратегії повоєнного відновлення України, сформованої урядом. I hope that together with the Ministry of Education and Science uh, and our partners, the academic and research communities, uh, large and medium-sized businesses, local authorities and the local community, we will find ways to effectively use the scientific and human resources, uh, potential of Ukrainian universities uh, in shaping a high-quality urban environment that will simultaneously meet the government's post-war recovery strategy for Ukraine. Role university in the post-war recovery strategy is in the formation of capital for the needs of the economy on the basis of mobilization and development of the resource potential of each citizen. The role of universities in the post-war urban renewal is to form high-quality human capital for the needs of economic development through the mobilization and development of the resource potential of each community. Kyivsky National University is a building of architecture, which I have heard, has the potential and the ability to form a scientific basis of strategic development of the city and territory through the study of economic, demographic and educational potential of the city agglomerations. Моя думка, що роль сучасного університету в кризових ситуаціях полягає у підтримці громадських ініціатив та надання аналітичної підтримки при прийнятті рішень важливих для громади. Досвід участі нашого університету у оцінці наслідків російського вторгнення для міст України 
та розробці технологій збереження історичних спадщинних під час військових дій підтверджує цю тезу. The Kyiv National University of Construction and Architecture, which I manage, has the potential of experience to form the scientific basis for the strategic development of cities and territories through research on the economic, demographic and educational potential of urban agglomerations. I believe that the role of a modern university in crisis situations is to support public initiatives, initiatives and provide analytical support in making decisions that are important to the community. The experience of CNUSA's uh, participation in accessing the, assessing the impact of the Russian invasion on Ukraine cities and developing technologies for preserving historical heritage during military operations confirms this thesis. Важливим кроком до досконалення управління університетом є налагодження тісних контактів між представниками роботодавців через механізм наглядових рад, який започаткований Міністерством освіти та науки України. Орієнтація на інтереси розвитку соціального відповідального місцевого бізнесу є актуальною відповіддю викликам, які стоять на шляху до формування якісного міського середовища повоєнних міст. An important step towards improving university governance is the establishment of close contacts between employers and representatives through the mechanism of supervisory boards, which was launched by the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine. Focusing on the interests of developing socially responsible local businesses is a relevant response to the challenges that stand in the way of creating a high-quality urban environment in post-war cities. Також важливим напрямком співпраці громад міста та університету є розвиток освіти дорослих, що є особливо важливим аспектом розвитку людського капіталу в умовах катастрофічного зниження кількості населення України. Тобто я не буду приводити цифри, тому що вони поливаються і не будуть такими точними, але те, що така проблема існує, це факт. Тому сучасні цифрові формати освіти розвиваються більшості українських університетів, але потребують участі та підтримки від наших закордонних партнерів. Another important area of cooperation between the city's communities and the university is uh, the development of uh, uh, education of adults, which is particularly important aspect of human capital development in the context of a uh, catastrophic decline of the population of Ukraine. Uh, I won't tell uh, digits uh, because it uh, always uh, differs from time to time. Modern digital formats of education are being developed by most Ukrainian universities, but require the participation and support of our foreign partners. Ukraine чітко визначила свій шлях на інтеграцію в європейський економічний, освітній та науковий простір. Саме тому ми розділяємо та підтримуємо принципи викладення в оновленій великій хартії університетів та прагнемо бути частиною цієї спільноти, спрямованої на подолання виклик, викликів та криз, яких так багато останнім часом. Дякую організаторам за можливість долучитися до обговорення. Ukraine has clearly defined its path to integration into the European economic, educational and scientific space. That's why we share and support the principles set out in the updated Magna Charta Universitarum. And we strive to aim at overcoming the challenges and crises that have been so numerous in recent years. I thank the organizers for the opportunity to join the discussion. Бажаю здоров'я всім присутнім і до перемоги і слава Україні. Glory to Ukraine. Professor Kulikov.
Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. We've had the voice of academia, time for uh, the voice of the government, whether national or local. The next speaker is also online from Ukraine, Professor Mikhail Wawinitsky, Deputy Minister of Education and Science, Ukraine. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, dear rectors, esteemed audience, <clears throat> I actually have a short presentation for you. I hope that you will be able to see it. Um, I'm very pleased that, uh, well, so far every single speaker has uh, mentioned at least or uh, spoken a little bit about Ukraine. Um, I'm eager to share some facts and figures uh, from Ukraine as well. Please tell me or signal to me if you can actually see my presentation at the moment. You should be able to see it. Unfortunately, I can't hear you. You do see it. Okay, wonderful. Thank yes, you. Yes, it's fine. The presentation so just a few things uh, so that the audience can... Uh, uh, I realize that there are many people there from Ukraine, but not all uh, are familiar uh, in the audience with the, our, uh, our, the landscape of the Ukrainian uh, higher education system. So just a few, a few facts. We have at the moment 182 and approximately 85 private universities. And when I say approximately, it's because of the fact that this number is in flux at the moment. Uh, the number has actually decreased by about 30% since 2014. And that decrease is, uh, is ongoing. We are uh, both due to a demographic crisis and also due to uh, issues that have to do with optimization or modernization of the network. Uh, as you can see, we are not a small educational uh, community, uh, uh, over 1,000, or excuse me, over 1 million students. Um, approximately 10% of that number, so about 120,000 by our estimates at the moment, are outside of Ukraine. That is approximately half of what was, what were the figures for 2022. And I will say some more thanks and gratitude to our partners, our university partners throughout the world for providing assistance when we most needed it, particularly in Poland. But I will speak more about that in a moment. Um, key reforms that have happened uh, over the last 10 years. We are now fully integrated with the European higher education area in terms of three cycles. ECTS, PhD reform has been completed. Uh, university autonomy is only partially implemented, as uh, Professor Kulikov today mentioned. Um, the issue of university autonomy and the introduction of supervisory boards is something that is very much um, on the agenda at the moment. We have a new quality assurance system that has to do with the launch of the National Agency for Higher Education Quality Assurance. I was had the privilege of being involved with that in 2019 to 2022. And frankly, I think that that was probably one of the best experiences in terms of what, what could have been done for the higher education system at the time. 2017 had a, a reform called the New Ukrainian School, which brought us competence-based programming for the, uh, for the school sector and also moving towards a 12-year school trajectory, which will obviously make a difference also for the higher education sector. Unfortunately, 2022 has brought us disaster. Uh, and that disaster has continued for over 600 days now. Uh, this building that you see at the moment is the Faculty of Economics of Karazin University in Kharkiv. Uh, and there are several similar buildings. Excuse me? You see it now. Okay, so I... I see. I apologize. Okay, so uh, those are my facts and figures. These are some of the things that have to do with the um, with the destruction. What we've seen in the last in in one year's time, we see 2,638 schools damaged, 437 completely destroyed. Of those, we have 57, and in fact, uh, that number is now higher. It's over 60 higher education institutions that have been damaged. Six have been completely destroyed. Some of the war-related challenges that we have been facing is the relocation of students and faculty members and staff. This has led to uh, some distorted learning, distorted research, and obviously problems with administration, and certainly risk to coherence of academic communities, which was compounded by COVID. So for in, man in many cases, we see uh, uh, students that are now in their third year of online learning, because of the fact that it was one and a half year due, due to lockdown of COVID and now one and a half years uh, due, to, um, due, to, due to the full-scale invasion. And it is quite possible that those, some of those students will actually have completed their bachelor's programs 
uh, without ever having entered into a classroom. These are obviously very big challenges for us. And these are leading to brain drain. And I will speak to, to, to the problem of brain drain in a moment, because although we are extremely grateful to our partners in uh, the European Union uh, and to individual universities who've done phenomenal things in terms of helping us with the exodus of, of students uh, and faculty and staff, we are at a stage today, particularly as the ministry, concerned about brain drain. And we will be speaking to that a little bit more. Financial issues that are system level. We've had an exodus of international students until January of, uh, actually until February 24th, 2022, Ukraine was host to approximately 73,000 international students. That number is now approximately 8,000. So obviously that has created some massive financial issues. Um, state funding for higher education was reduced in 2023 by over 40%. Uh, and at this point, we are now trying to, uh, to, to return some of those levels of, of financing because obviously with a drop of 40% in one year, that has made many higher education institutions, quite frankly, unsustainable. Admission of Ukrainian students abroad reduces tuition incomes to higher education institutions in Ukraine, which obviously causes some financial stresses. We are extremely grateful to the early and rapid relief effort, efforts of our international partners. Uh, particularly from the European University Association, but also from the UK. Uh, we have a, a, a very successful twinning program that was put together by an organization called Cormac Consulting. Erasmus Plus has turned out to be not just about international credit mobility and exchanges, but in fact was an instrument for uh, uh, helping to house many of our students last year. We've had a, a massive influx of online webinars, open lectures, joint research projects. Um, we are very grateful that the Russian higher education institutions and QA agencies have been removed from the U European Union organizations. We believe that's extremely important, not only as a symbolic gesture of support, it's also important because um, the Russian higher education system has obviously proven itself to be a failure um, if we believe that higher education is also about uh, creation of or engendering certain values and also worldviews. And certainly uh, this is not something that the Russians have been showing. Uh, and democratic values are not something that they've been demonstrating within Ukraine. The Ukrainian Global University Project has been very successful. We've seen access to open scientific bases. Ukrainian study centers and visiting profession professorships have been, uh, have been quite common. I do want to show one thing, uh, and it, this is actually, uh, I apologize if uh, perhaps what I'll do is I'll show this first. Um, what this map, oh, excuse me, that's not going to work that way. Um, sorry about that. Uh, the first map shows you uh, the numbers of people that exited Ukraine in 2022. And this is where we are extremely grateful to our Polish friends. Poland has turned out to be, um, well, has, has opened its arms uh, to Ukrainian refugees. As we have seen, we are extraordinarily grateful and we are grateful to everything that has been done in terms of provision of uh, facilities for our students as well. And this goes also for Slovakia and, and Czechia and, and Hungary and Romania and, and Germany and France and all of, our, all of our European partners have actually opened their arms and obviously their, their pocketbooks as well in terms of helping Ukrainian students and staff last year. I do want to mention, however, that the uh, level of effect of the war at this point on Ukraine is very uneven. We see, obviously, large occupied territories in the south and east, but we also see deoccupied areas in the north, the east, in the Kharkiv area, and also in the south around Kherson. So um, we are, are, as a ministry, we find it very difficult to message that. We see very large regional differences. For example, Mariupol University has now been destroyed completely, but they, they have been uh, relocated to Kyiv and their community is very strong, but nevertheless, they are a relocated university. Kherson University was occupied and then liberated. Their, their infrastructure was just recently damaged again. Again, Kherson University uh, ha was, uh, was, was relocated to ivano frankivsk Mikolaev University was never relocated. Uh, was never under occupation. However, basically all the higher education institutions of Mikolaev were either destroyed or damaged. And obviously they are in need of uh, not just uh, human capacity rebuilding, but also in terms of um, 
physical capacity rebuilding. Kharkiv University and others in Kharkiv were damaged by rocket attack, which I showed you at the very beginning of this presentation. Odessa, Dnipro, Zaporizhia, these are cities that are under constant rocket attack, but nevertheless continue to have teaching, continue to have very often in class, uh, but mostly online uh, teaching in classes. Kyiv was largely evacuated in February and May of 2022. Now is continued uh, threat of rocket attack, but has returned largely to offline offline learning. Sumy, Poltava, Rivna, Zhitomir, these have infrastructure damaged, uh, but now are under constant attack. But nevertheless, many have returned to offline. Whereas Western Ukraine, Lviv, Vinnytsia, Ternopil, Ivano-Frankivsk, Chernivtsi, Zakarpatia, these are offline learning and largely uninterrupted. So the message here is that the, uh, the the landscape of higher education in Ukraine is very, very uneven. From the east and the north, uh, where we have primarily online learning, to the center, where it's a mixed situation because of, of sent threats of rocket attack, and in the west, where largely offline learning has continued and in fact is prospering because student numbers have increased due to internal migration from the east towards the west. So when we looked into the medium and long term, it's important for us to understand how we can partner with our European friends and what we can do in order to improve um, these, the, the conf where conferences like today's can be useful uh, to both sides. We believe that the future is with joint degree pro programming. We believe that there's a we can counter the risk of brain drain by using modern technologies, particularly something called collaborative online international learning at the BA level. Uh, if our European friends are able to help us more with, our, with funding, and we are grateful for that, and we understand that um, perhaps in many cases this, this, this request is even a little bit tiresome to many, but nevertheless, what, we're, what we would see as being extraordinarily important would be targeted funding for Ukraine-based uh, postgraduate programs at the MA and PhD level. We definitely will require infrastructure and capacity building, targeted funding for joint research between twinned higher education institutions. And I, I, I cannot say this enough, we are extraordinarily grateful for everything that was done last year to help our uh, students and our faculty and our staff that were forcibly removed from Ukraine into uh, the European Union countries. However, at this point, we have a war to win and we have a country to rebuild and we need our best brains here. So we ask you for, for help in creating non-resident fellowships so that Ukrainian researchers can continue their research in Ukraine. This is extremely important for us because at this point, we see a very large number of students and faculty returning to Ukraine. However, many are not returning due to economic hardship reasons rather than for safety reasons. And finally, twinning for Ukrainian higher education institutions is extremely important and support for university autonomy is something that we are at the moment expanding upon. And then uh, we have certain initiatives that are at the moment being tabled that will increase the flexibility of learning programs gained uh, aimed at student agency and responsibility and also merging and modernizing our university network hopefully that uh, was not too much information for you i apologize if it was and i hopefully uh, i wish you all the most uh, uh, um, uh, the most uh, fruitful of discussions possible uh, and uh, i'm i would be pleased to answer any questions that the audience might have Thank you very much, Professor Vinitsky, for your presentation and for your address. Next up, I have the pleasure of welcoming Deputy Mayor of the City of Łódź, Mr. Adam Pustelnik, to take the floor. Adam, please, the floor is yours. Magnificencies, honorable guests. Don't worry about it. I have a lot of numbers here and data, but uh, I'll not read it out to you all. Uh, and I'll already explain you why. Here on all those pages is a conclusion and an essence of all that has happened, not only in my city, but in the surroundings, as an answer 
to Russian invasion of Ukraine and to support our Ukrainian partners, friends, brothers and sisters, however you define it, in the, in the crisis and in the, uh, that was a result uh, of the war and Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, I will deliber deliberately not mention all the percentages and amounts because it's not the clue of the issue. The clue of the issue is something that I'm very proud of, not only as a mayor of the city, but as a Pole. First time, and hopefully last one, since, uh, since I remember, since I've ever seen, the entire country of Poland felt like if they were actually touched and affected by what happened in, to our brother, sister nation. Uh, the answer of Polish society, because it was not the answer of government, of a local government, of course, government, local government were a part of it. However, it was mostly the answer of various layers of Polish society. Ordinary citizens, companies, businesses, institutions, universities. Every layer of Polish, uh, of Polish society imagined ourselves, because this is our historic perspective, that what happened to Ukraine could really happen to us. And how would we feel if no one supported us, if no one helped us. That's why you didn't have to wait for long. Everyone, even my skeptical wife, when two young people uh, from Odessa stepped you know, in front of our door, even though we have two small children, uh, uh, a dog and my father, who was, very, uh, who was very sick, lived in our uh, house, and when she saw two young, very young people uh, that were brought to our house by one of, by one of the non-governmental organization, and, and I said, Beata, let them stay with us for a couple months. She was, no, nah, Adam, we have two small babies and, and your sick father and everything. I said, and I said one sentence, Beata, this is the name of my wife. Imagine yourself, me and you, that we would be in the same situation. What would happen if someone denied us help? And she said, okay. Uh, let, them, uh, let them take the baby's room, the babies will go with us. Uh, and uh, we lived together for a couple months, which, which was really a surreal uh, experience, but we were really happy and we really felt, and that's what our families, friends, and other institutions felt, that it really could happen to us. And what would we do if someone denied us support? And why, uh, why this imagination or the image that this could really happen to us was so real? Because we, as Ukraine, and as many of the nations and people of Central and Eastern Europe, shared the same historic and political perspective. Uh, Russia's policies, or tendencies, I don't want to use uh, a stronger words, but affected us historically in many, in many aspects and in many fields. We have a certain perspective that maybe not everyone in Europe shares and maybe not everyone in the world understands. However, this is our perspective. We live in this certain part of the world and as histori history has proven, <laughs> our historic perspective has some fundaments and unfortunately has a lot of proofs historically and the war that outbroke in 2022 is unfortunately uh, another sign that uh, our perspectives, our suspicions and our approach towards aggressive policies of Russian Federation have some arguments and have very strong fundaments. Uh, coming back to, to, the, to the answer and how it was shaped, uh, as I said in the beginning of my, uh, of my speech, first, first time ever, and up to this point, the last one, I saw something like that. And uh, why it was so unique? Usually, when, when, out, when wars outbreak, 
when massive crises happen, there is a very strong role of the state. Many people coordinate that. There are some public policies. And here, the very unique aspect was the spontaneous answer, uh, in which I'm very proud of several elements. Uh, happened some of the policies and projects that were biggest or most spectacular worldwide in their fields. There is a company in which this, this project I'm particularly proud of. This is the biggest pharma company in Poland. It's called Pelion Healthcare Group. Together with also the, one of the world's leading uh, humanitarian organizations, direct relief from California, those two entities with our, with our small support created uh, a totally unique and I think the most massive support program in Poland. It was called Health for Ukraine, where direct relief and the American partners and donors supported the biggest pharma company in Poland to distribute a system of, I don't know how to even say that, kind of pharma checks, where uh, our brothers and sisters from Ukraine could, could without any cash involvement, buy necessary medicine, including very special ones, and they were funded by Pelion, by Direct Relief, and by uh, part of the American donors. It solved one of the very fundamental issues that, uh, that was related to, the, uh, to a situation that no one was prepared for, health healthcare system and taking care of the ill was one of the fundamental issues and challenges to tackle. This program Health for Ukraine is something extraordinary and uh, it's tackled it very quickly and with enormous amounts uh, of funds that were a result of big hearts of our pro partners from the other side of the ocean. Some other elements that were really, really spectacular and I have to admit that was the answer of Polish state that creates solutions that made it possible for our uh, Ukrainian partners to, to feel safe, to have the social security system like uh, it was a copy-paste system uh, from what was related to Polish citizens to Ukrainian citizens. I think it was a very good decision. And I think that there are some of the fundaments that are a part of the answer to such a radical situation. Some of them is health healthcare system, social security system, housing, taking care of the children, and having some tools and policies to make people feel like they are part of the community. The elements of providing the social security and social stabilities, uh, they, they, were, uh, they were and they are still there. I think it was a wonderful decision. The elements regarding healthcare were also there. However, the things that were the biggest challenge, and we, we tackled this challenge, but uh, it, was, it was something really difficult, but I'm really very proud of the teachers of, uh, of Poland and particularly of my city. Uh, tens of thousands of Ukrainian children, they entered the system almost overnight. Uh, the educational system of Poland was never prepared for such solutions. The system was ineffective even without that. However, somehow, and I don't know how, with God's help probably, uh, without additional massive funding, without some very fancy or uh, sophisticated tools, somehow spontaneously by extraordinary effort of, of, of teachers in kindergartens, uh, of staff in nurseries, of uh, people at schools and universities, uh, we managed to implement a cycle of solutions to make people feel a part of community, to eliminate a fundamental barrier, an obstacle, or a boundary, if you wish, that happens in such situation, which is language. Of course, Polish and Ukrainian uh, are quite, quite similar. They have some similar similarities, but you know, it's a different case to, to manage in a grocery store than to learn Polish literature or maths in, in foreign language. And somehow, 
as I said, I, it, 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 it's a miracle. The educational system managed to absorb it somehow. And here, uh, from this stage, I would like to thank, I don't know if the representatives of UNICEF are here, but them, with, uh, with a big part of Swiss donors, they contributed to our uh, educa educational system uh, very strongly, and I will never be grateful uh, enough for their support. But generally, I will not go into very deep details. It everything we managed as a nation, as a city community, to properly address those enormous challenges, not because we are very genius or super bright city managers, not because we are very genius or super bright politicians or managers, but because a grassroots movement from the every sphere and every ladder of Polish society said, we want to be a part of it. We want to contribute. We want to support. And this is the only reason why we, sometime, why, why we somehow coped with it. Otherwise, we could implement 100 or 1,000 super advanced legal solutions. We could make a lot of announcements, many uh, complex policies, and we would fail. Somehow we, somehow we didn't, and no matter what everyone will say, the only reason behind that was a full motivation, mobilization effort by Polish society. Uh, last but not least, uh, even though I come from a migrant family myself, uh, my father escaped Poland during times of martial law, that's why I was born and raised in Germany. And uh, a big parts of my family still stayed in Germany, France, various parts of the world. My father, after the collapse of communism, decided to come back to Poland, but not everyone of our family did the same. And no matter what uh, people of Ukraine will choose, some of the, if some of them will choose to stay in Poland or in some other part of the world, or if they decide to, uh, to come back to Ukraine, which I really keep my fingers crossed for, because I'm sure that Ukraine will win this war and they will, that will be rebuilt, uh, I don't know when, but I'm sure uh, it will. And definitely Ukraine needs human potential and needs their top brains to be back there and be a part of the process. But uh, no matter what's gonna happen, uh, there haven't been so many times in history when I was so happy seeing all those people on the streets of, of my city and being a part of the system. And I'll very briefly explain you why. If, if a city or a country does not manage to be a successful melting pot, does not manage to be attractive for people from all over the world, does not manage to include in the community people from various countries, various continents, various cultures, it will never succeed. The reason why London is London, why New York is New York, why Berlin is Berlin, and why some other booming top metropolis of the world are what they are, because they manage to facilitate tools, potential, and magnetism from people from various backgrounds, various parts of the world, various communities, to come there, seek opportunities there, build their future there. Otherwise, what is a city? It's a system of streets and buildings. If it will not attract the people in life, it's nothing. And that's why uh, I really hope that my city and my country will remain and will build this capacity to attract people from whatever they come from, uh, to seek opportunities there and feel he here like if it was their home. This multicultural structure and being a magnet from people from all over the world was the reason why the city succeeded and why it became the second fastest growing city in the world after Chicago in the 19th century. Of course, I would like to repeat this process and I would love to see uh, our, uh, part of our Ukrainian brother sister part of it, but only on their conditions. If someone would like to be here and stay here, I would love to see that and I would love to see people see this place as their home. However, not being forced here, but only if they would choose to. And uh, this, is, this is the conclusion that I will make that uh, I really, really hope that soon 
sooner than later, all the people of Ukraine will have the opportunity to safely come back to their homes, be part of this rebuilding process. I really hope that the second Marshall Plan for Ukraine Forgive me this, you know, this this expression, but uh, this is uh, this is the only equivalent historic equivalent that I can look for. Uh, and those ones who will decide to choose Poland as their place to live, feel here like at home, but only on your conditions and with your home being opened to you safely as it used to be then. Uh, really, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to, to the entire academic community that came to this conference. It's a really big honor to us because Magna Carta Universitatum is, uh, its policies, its values, they are really close to our heart and it's an honor for a city to host you here. And uh, to all the people from Ukraine, uh, I, I don't hope. I am sure that uh, at some point, I don't know where, Ukraine will see its victory and uh, we'll, we'll go back to normal and all the people who want to be there, live there, uh, will be able to live there peacefully and safely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I think you've just echoed the sentiment of many of us here in the audience in which in Poland and in Ukraine. We go back to the Ukrainian perspective now, and may I invite Mr. Vitaly Biwi, Council of the Ambassador of Ukraine in the Republic of Poland, who will read the letter on behalf of His Excellency, Mr. Vassil Zvaric, Ukrainian Ambassador to Poland. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I would like to thank Mr. Mayor and to all inhabitants of Luch City, to all Poles, for your great support, for your great solidarity with Ukraine. And I really appreciate for that. And not only me, but all Ukrainian people, we really appreciate for your help because it's very crucial support in order to bring the victory uh, of Ukraine. I, I've got uh, really a great mission here, and it's an honor for me also to welcome you uh, on behalf of the ambassador of Ukraine to the Republic of Poland, Mr. Vasil Zvaric. And uh, I've got a letter, ambassador's letter, which I would like to read. Organizers and participants of the opening ceremony of the Magna Carta Observatory's anniversary conference in Luch. Your Magnificence, dear Rector, dear Magna Carta Observatory Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, thank you sincerely for the invitation. I warmly greet all the organizers and participants of the Magna Carta Observatives Anniversary Conference, Universities and Reconstruction of Cities, the Role of Research and Education. It brings me great satisfaction to witness the University of Luch hosting such a significant international event which has dedicated focus on the world's leading universities uniting to extend their support to Ukraine, particularly in its past towards reconstruction following the devastating impact of the Russian war of aggression. More than 140 countries and millions of people around the world are supporting Ukraine. We are grateful to everyone who helps our country in its darkest times. Since the start of their invasion, the Russians have fired approximately 3,000 missiles at Ukrainian cities and towns and destroyed more than 120,000 civilian infrastructure facilities, including power plants, gas pipelines, schools, kindergartens, and numerous residential buildings. The recovery of Ukraine is to become the largest economic project in Europe of our time. It's already estimated at hundreds of billions of dollars given the imperative to modernize Ukrainian infrastructure, considering the security assistance, we are looking at an investment exceeding a trillion dollars. 
the world has been showing unprecedented solidarity with Ukraine. This solidarity is steadfast and multidimensional. It's reflected in political statements, military support, humanitarian aid, or financial assistance. This strong solidarity is also expressed in welcoming millions of Ukrainians and making them feel at home. It's also reflected in providing students the opportunity to continue their studies far from home. Ukrainians will always remember this outstanding empathy and humanity. I believe no one will deny the great value that human capital has for a country. It's a key driving force for any country's development. That is why a country's intellectual strength is usually one of the aggressor's priority targets to annihilate the nation. I would like to thank you all for understanding the critical importance of preserving Ukraine's intellectual capital for the country's reconstruction and further development after we win this unprovoked war. Please keep on helping us maintain and develop Ukraine's intellectual strength, assisting Ukrainian students and academics. Ukraine has also set an ambitious goal to launch accession talks the, with the EU this year. Speaking about the Ukraine-EU relationship, I cannot but mention the outstanding role of Poland as a strong advocate of Ukraine's membership in the U European Union. In that context, I believe that all European universities could also make an important contribution to the process of Ukraine's integration with the EU. Your bonds with Ukrainian universities and your joint academic work could be an efficient tool to implement EU standards not only in Ukraine's education and academic domain, but also in many other areas, including the process of rebuilding Ukraine as a strong European state, which in turn it's, is a necessary factor in building a new security architecture for our region. Thank you once again for your strong solidarity with Ukraine and thus for your commitment to the shared values of humanity for your efforts to help Ukraine and Ukrainian universities develop and flourish. May we all strongly believe in Ukraine's victory and work together to achieve it as soon as possible. I wish you productive discussions and once again extend my warmest greetings. With kind regards, Vasil Zvarec, Ambassador of Ukraine to the Republic of Poland. Thank you very much. Mr. Councillor, thank you very much, and please convey our gratitude to Mr. Ambassador. Last but not least, uh, it's time to uh, hear the students' perspective. May I invite Ms. Polina Hombalewska, who is President of the Ukrainian Association, Association of Students, to take the floor. First of all, let me thank for being able to hear uh, the voice of Ukrainian students and to give you their students' perspective on these topics. I would like to start from the point that over the last decade, the Ukrainian higher education area has already begun at least three difficult challenges. The revolution of dignity and the start of full-scale invasion of Russia against Ukraine in 2014 caused a disruption in higher education area and the first wave of universities relocation. The COVID pandemic, which has become a challenge for higher educational area worldwide, and it caused the, the transition from the traditional in-person learning format uh, to distance learning format but also gave us a lot of innovations and new positive practices. And the third one today we talk about is the 24th of February 2022, which was the horrific, planned and brutal full-scale invasion on the territory of the independent state of Ukraine of, by Russia Federation. It was a challenge with 
was the most unprecedented and cruel one, which aims to destroy our educational area, exterminate the Ukrainian nation and democracy of our world. A challenge that neither we nor the world was ready for. Challenge which had led to the complete disruption of the educational process, the rapid growth in the territory that were occupied by Russian invaders, number of regions where active hostilities were taking place, mobilization of academic staff and students, the second wave of, university of universities relocation, large number of Ukrainian and foreign students who were forced to flow the country and leave their homes to other regions of Ukraine or even abroad. During that time, our government, and in particular our Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine, became the center of strategic decision making. Higher educational institutions became humanitarian and evacuation headquarters. And young people of Ukraine and students became a consolidated and powerful force. I would like to stress that important and significant for Ukraine from the first days of the full-scale invasion war was the support of all your countries, was the support of the world. For us, for our organization, for Ukrainian Association of Students, meaningful support was from the European Student Union, which means the support from more than 40 national student unions from European countries, with the constant communication and involvement in our current situation. Now I would like to tell you a little bit more about our organization. The Ukrainian Association of Students is the National Union of Ukraine, which has been protecting students' rights since it's established in 1999. Now we unite more than 150 local student unions all over Ukraine in 25 regions. And we have 25 regional subdivisions. Since 2007, we've been a member of the European Student Union, which allows us to represent Ukrainian students at the international level, to adopt positive practices of the European higher education area and implement them in our country, in our state, in Euro Ukrainian higher education area, to provide opportunities for Ukrainian students and to promote our vision of consolidating students for the realization of common interests, not only on our national level, but internationally. Our main areas of activity is include uh, protection, student rights, student self-government development, involvement in the development of higher education quality system, involve, uh, representation of the interests of our members and the whole student society. Our largest project were aimed at improving the higher education system and ensuring student participation in these processes at all, at all levels. We initiated amendments to the law of Ukraine on higher education um, about student self-governance, which is a unique achievement of student self-governance. We lobbied for reforms to expand the rights of students and student government bodies. We established the structural unit of the U.S., the National Association of Student Experts on the quality of higher education to ensure the participation of students in the quality assurance system of Ukraine. However, the full-scale war in Ukraine had a significant impact on our activities too. Relocated universities, internally displaced students, safety during the educational process, students' mental health, access to education and overcoming educational losses become our priorities. Less than a month after the full-scale invasion, we launched a national student survey on further educational process and enrollment campaign 
during wartime. It, it gave us information about students' struggles all over Ukraine. Also, with the wave of relocated universities and internally displaced students, uh, we launched a housing campaign together with the help of Swiss and Austrian student unions and began to provide assistance and financial support for students who had fled the occupied regions and areas where hostilities were taking place. Also, one more project, and the newest one, is the DG Uni. It is the open um, Ukrainian initiative, and we, we are working on this project with, in cooperation with 10 Ukrainian universities and also partners from European countries. And the aim of this project is to deal the chaotic processes of digital transformation in education with the creation of a single digital ecosystem of Ukraine that will provide conscious, high-quality, inclusive and transparent education regardless of the location of the participants and all stakeholders. Of course, providing opportunities for students to, for unity, for creating a proactive student community and sharing experiences and positive practices is also an important component, especially after uh, several years of distance learning. Therefore, we have a number um, list of different activities, projects, and travel, uh, training programs which are aimed at developing student activism, and one um, of which is the International Student Exchange Program. It is like a mentorship program with the cooperation of local student unions or higher education institutions and the national student unions. And uh, by the way, uh, tomorrow with uh, our representatives of um, Student Parliament of the Republic of Poland, we will go from the Warsaw to Lviv and Kyiv to start our first initiative. And also we're looking for new cooperation to continue these initiatives to give students this opportunity to exchange their knowledges and um, develop their societies. However, the key issue for implementing such projects is safety. Every week or even every day, the number of damaged university buildings increases and every air raid siren stops someone's heartbeat. One of our main projects, which has started working on a few months after the full-scale invasion, is the information and fundraising campaign stood help. Chance, to one, chance for one to save millions is the tagline of this project. We are convinced that it's necessary to educate citizens, and especially students and academic staff, in first aid. And together with a group of volunteer medics, U.S. is providing such tactical emergency medical aid courses on the base of higher educational institutions all over Ukraine. We have a goal to provide trainings to as many students as it possible throughout Ukraine, but it requires support with finances and resources. Therefore, we are really we are very grateful for new waves of cooperation to achieve this goal and to provide Ukrainian students with the skills which will help them to save their lives. For the spreading of the real situation, we have created this Student Health website where we collected five stories which illustrates struggles of Ukrainian students who are trying to support their lives in the midst of war. Through these stories, we hope to give you an opportunity to look into the lives of those affected by this cynical war and demonstrate that youth of Ukraine need help more than ever. Every time while I present this project, I hope that it will soon lose its relevance. However, six 
hundred days after the full-scale invasion has recently passed. And our struggle and fight within this challenge is still ongoing. The whole world sees the power of our country, of our nation, of our, our higher education system, but it's scary to realize what is the real price for that. At this moment, it is important to remember how crucial Ukraine's victory in this war is. Today, right now, Ukrainian defenders, men and women, are standing on the front line with weapons in their hands. And we should remember that tomorrow it could be students and academic staff and colleagues from your universities. Today, right now, it's almost 10, it's almost nine years, and more than 600 after the full-scale invasion, our, our army continues to fight on the front line. And on our common path to victory, future processes of reconstruction and rebuilding, and avoiding such terroristic wars in the future, universities must continue to fulfill their role on our path to victory. We believe that this role includes state building and conscious state building and ideology formation. This role about growing active students into conscious citizens of our countries. And we strongly believe that the university's role in these processes is to change our societies. And we believe that we have all the instruments in our hands for doing that. And let's do it together. Thank you for standing with Ukraine and thank you for your unwavering support. Slava Ukraini. Madam President, Polina, thank you for this moving address, very important words. And may I invite Mr. Maxim Svisenko, more member of Ukrainian Students League, to take the floor now. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, dear organizers, dear honorable audience. First of all, I would like to say that it's a great honor for our organization uh, to participate in this conference. We believe that we share common values and we look forward for further deep cooperation. I am, as a representative of Ukrainian Students League, uh, not the oldest, but the largest students' organization in Ukraine, uh, want to thank not only the people who now sit here, but uh, all the people of uh, European Union, especially the people of Poland for supporting Ukraine. We really feel it and we really appreciate it. Our organization was created by students and for students to develop and uh, fully support the student community, as well as movement and projects that affect life of YAS in Ukraine. The main mission of our organization is to unite Ukrainian students to protect their rights, develop the current educational system, and shape the values of Ukrainian civil society. The Ukrainian Students League is enough young organization that was founded during the COVID-19 pandemic but which grows rapidly. Nowadays, we unite more than 60, the most respected universities of Ukraine, and more than 20 YAS NGOs. So currently, we represent more than 420,000 students. It became possible due to the big number of opportunities that we provide to the students and absolutely transparency. By combining the resources and the development vectors formatted by the students' self-governments, we implement various projects and programs. For example, science conferences 
and sport competitions. Uh, I want to mention about our big project, Derzhava Tvoritz, which uh, translated like State Builder. This is a national program uh, who, which proposed is to create a system of personal and professional development of YAS in Ukraine, to develop responsible leadership and to increase the level of the civic activity of YAS. 100 YAS people from different regions of Ukraine have become graduated of the program. They already created a proactive all-Ukrainian community. On July 22 this year, the National Wide Forum State Creator Yas People in Charge of Change was held in Kyiv. It was the biggest Yas Forum since the Ukrainian independence. Virtuous government officials, famous entrepreneurs, journalists, volunteers, and representatives of the Ukrainian civil society, together with more than 1,000 students from all over the Ukraine, discussed the possibilities of realizing Yas in Ukraine and the need for joint efforts for the successful reconstruction of the state. Then we started the second stage of our, pro of our project, is a professional and educational course for YAS people, state creator, YAS is important. For 35 selected students on the basis of Kyiv School of State Administration, where more than 40 top speakers taught students soft and hard skills in insult community values. Not only this, but we have a really big number of other projects. For example, meeting with state authorities, including of representatives of Ministry of Education and Sciences of Ukraine. We are deeply grateful to Mr. Mikhail Vinitsky, who took the floor today uh, for his really deep involvement in the activity of our organization. Not only this, but we also provide pleasant bonuses for students, such as students' discounts, priority places, and various events, for example, conference of, or uh, concerts, uh, which helps students to be more proactive. We also provide students with internships at private businesses and government agencies, and so on, so on, so on. Starting from the beginning of Russian full-scale invasion into Ukraine, Ukraine Students League supply humanitarian goods to eternal displaced persons, hospitals, and armed forces of Ukraine. We deliver humanitarian goods to the hard-to-reach areas and the areas of hostilities. We also provide shelters to the free accommodation of eternal displaced persons who have been forced to leave their homes due to Russia's wars against Ukraine. We have opened and managed six shelters in Dnipro, where up to 300 eternal displaced persons can live. We pay special attention to the educational and formative development of students and teenagers. We have provided assistance and housing for more than 5,000 eternal displaced persons. We also built the most modern center for long-term accommodation of eternal displaced persons in the building of university dormitory that was out of use for uh, more than 10 years. It's like an example of cooperation between active YAS and universities. The center can accommodate up to 80 eternal displaced persons, and it consists of 25 separate bedrooms, uh, 50 shared bathrooms, three shared kitchens, three sharing dining rooms, three shared uh, lounge rooms, but this is not all. It also consists of a uh, co-working space, lecture hall, ch children play, uh, playground. It also provides possibilities for eternal displaced persons, including students, to restart their life, to find how to rely them in new hosting communities. Families with children and students affected by the Russian war against Ukraine live in this center. We have also successfully organized six charity festivals in Lviv, Dnipro, and Kyiv. The festival features performances by famous musicians and stand-up comedians, and students, visitors can enjoy lectures, food courts, master classes, and game zones. The money raised at this festival is used for the humanitarian needs of Ukrainians affected by the war. I also want to mention about our priorities for the next year. First of all, 
We want to expand our international projects, build better communication with Ukrainian students who live in Europe, implementation of our projects to help Ukrainians abroad. By the way, our projects, Ukrainian students worldwide, unite more than 16 Ukrainian communities in, Ukraine, in European Union countries. It's more than 1,500 students that cooperate and help each other with not only accommodation, but also with some educational processes and so on. Secondly, continuing the humanitarian projects to face the problems of, caused by the war. Thirdly, improve the cooperation with temporarily displaced universities of Ukraine. We heard that Mikhail Vinitsky told about it and emphasized that this is one of the main priorities now. The so next one is to operate more with the Ministry of Education and Sciences of Ukraine to implement changes to the current legislation and the strategy for the development of higher educational system of Ukraine. We do it now and we will do it for the further. We also uh, plan to involve students to the program of, of post-war reconstruction of Ukraine. For example, the team of Ukrainian students League together with expert and local government, created the strategy of reconstruction of Bucha. This city was fully destroyed by Russian soldiers. And just imagine, now this plan is a, basis docu is a basic document uh, for its rebuilding. And uh, the, our international partners, Ukrainian government, uh, recognize this document. This document was fully created by the students. The last but not the least, we plan to launch the projects with students veterans to integrate them into society and the student community. We want to show them uh, that they are fighting for, not just for some borders, not just for some square kilometers, but for the whole nation, but the values uh, that unites not only all the Ukrainians, but Ukrainians and EU members. More information about our projects implemented by Ukrainian Students League you can easily find uh, on our official website, on our official sources uh, via Facebook or Instagram. But uh, I will be happy uh, to tell you about all our projects and the possibility of cooperation during these three days in person. Thanks for your attention and thanks for supporting Ukraine. Thank you very much, Mr. Svisenko. Our time is almost up, but uh, I think we can accommodate one or two very short questions before the refreshment break. So if anyone has any feedback or a question to one of the speakers or a comment to make, please go ahead. Okay, may I just say that uh, I thought that this was a very fitting and timely opening to our conference. We've had multiple perspectives uh, on Poland and uh, Ukraine, uh, both uh, regionally and uh, from a, a larger perspective, um, both from academia, from uh, the governing um, echelons of academia, from the students, uh, from uh, the members of diplomacy and from the members of the local and national government. Thank you once again to all the speakers online and present here. Thank you for your input, for presenting your points of view. Thank you all to all the members in the audience for listening. We'll now take a refreshment break and uh, reconvene shortly. Thank you.
Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot promise you um, the passion and the emotion of the previous session. Um, but what I can promise you is news of activities which your observatory is undertaking which will enable you to make a difference and to support not only Ukraine, um, but other countries as well. It is my pleasure to present a review of what your observatory has achieved in 2023. Also, as we approach a review of our strategy, I will share a reflection of the journey which we have traveled over the last 10 years and invite your input as we start work on charting our course 
for the period 2025 to 2030. The context in which we work continues to develop in different directions. While the Academic Freedom Index reports marked improvements in a few countries, uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan are prominent in that list this year. Nevertheless, um, it found academic freedom to be in retreat for over 50% of the world's population. That is a very challenging situation. The circumstances faced by universities in countries such as Hungary and Turkey continue to be worrying. We see issues causing concern in other countries and in 2024, we will attempt to focus on those in the United States of America when our anniversary takes place in Washington. Although we do not know the full extent of it, information which has been received suggests that signatory universities have been most generous with their support for universities in Ukraine following the extremely challenging situation which they've faced about which we have just been hearing. We are very pleased to welcome representatives of universities and students from uh, Ukraine to Wuch and we would like to recognize the very warm welcome which the University of Wuch has given to them and to us in organizing this event and making this possible. In the last year, we have added translations of the Magna Carta Universitatum in Ukrainian, Polish, and Catalan, and they've been prepared by colleagues in signatory universities, some of whom are in the room this evening. And we know that other translations are currently being prepared. We're also in the process of arranging translations of the living values, guidelines. Those who help in this work are helping to make those values more globally accessible and also helping the means to give them full effect to many people across the globe. And we're very grateful to them. A significant innovation this year is that the Magna Carta Observatory organized its first essay competition for students. This attracted 97 entries from 24 different countries. The essay question was, how might students exercise more influence in enabling their universities to make a more effective contribution to society? And in our last session, we've had some wonderful examples of how students have led on that. The competition was organized in collaboration with the Global Students Forum and the European Students Union. It was judged by a globally diverse panel of students and staff and men and women. And we welcome the five student winners of that competition to Wuch, and you will see them on Wednesday when they receive their certificates in the signing ceremony. And you will hear them tomorrow, because so popular has this been that we are going to live stream the session when they will read and discuss their essays. And what I should say is only five students could actually win the uh, expenses package to, to come to Wuch. 
but we have had the nicest and the most engaged correspondence from students who took part but did not win, but who want to support the work of Magna Carta. Also, regarding students, the Magna Carta Observatory has for some years worked with student organizations, nominees of two of which, the Global Student Forum and the European Students Union, are in membership of the Magna Carta Council. At the signing ceremony on Wednesday, we will be taking this to a higher level. And when we sign a, a memorandum with the Global Student Forum to recognize future joint projects that we are going to, to do. During the year, Magna Carta Observatory launched its research project. The theme selected to align with the emphasis of Magna Carta 2020 was the responsive and responsible university. Proposals were invited from signatory universities to engage in the collaborative projects with Magna Carta. 19 were received. And after a criteria-based evaluation, eight were selected, and I'm pleased that representatives of six of those eight are present with us at this event. We have just concluded the first workshop with this group of universities. Um, it's been a wonderful experience, a huge learning experience for all of us, and the group wants to repeat that uh, in the future, maybe hosted by one of the sites. And so I'm delighted that Magna Carta is playing a role again in bringing universities together. Our Magna Carta observatories are now, uh, ambassadors, sorry, are now engaged in supporting research projects as well as universities undertaking the Living Values Project. And we are enormously grateful to them for all that they add to the Magna Carta Observatory. They increase greatly our capacity to, to take action. And um, in addition, ambassadors, um, a couple of whom are in the room, are working with us to develop leadership capacity building materials which will help in the preparation of student leaders and also university leaders. And you'll be able to learn more about that at the World Cafe session tomorrow afternoon. We've also continued to organize webinars and to collaborate with kindred global and regional bodies. Uh, my colleague from the International Association of Universities uh, is here and will be leading a table uh, tomorrow afternoon. EUA, Scholars at Risk, the Association of Arab Universities, the Global Consortium and the student bodies that I've mentioned have all collaborated with us actively over the last year. More universities are engaging with the Living Values Project and we welcome reports on their experience which we can publish so that they help other signatories. We welcome invitations to participate in relevant global or regional symposia and I was very pleased to be the guest of Epoca University in Albania earlier on this year. They featured the Magna Carta uh, very significantly uh, in their regional conference and uh, very, very grateful for that and other similar offers. The Association of Arab Universities invited us to join them in Tunisia where we were able to address some 300 rectors on the theme of student engagement 
and we will be collaborating with the Association of Arab Universities when we go uh, to Qatar later next month. But let me stand back. Over the previous 10 years, the Magna Carta Observatory has advanced from having a primary focus on the Magna Carta document, developing advocacy and underlining the aspirational role of the document. And it's developed to focusing much more on how that document is put into practice in universities and how it enables universities to have a greater impact and make a greater contribution to society. Nearly 1,000 universities from 94 countries have now signed the first, second, or both of the Magna Cartas, creating a large and diverse multicultural international group. The strategy adopted by the Council for the period 2020 to 2025 is progressing well. And the activities above that I've mentioned um, hopefully demonstrate that. Between now and the end of 2024, it's a priority for the Council to prepare a strategy that will take us to 2030 and beyond. And that's addressing the question of how the Magna Carta can best help universities to have impact. Now to inform that strategy, for the first time as far as I know, we want your input I will write out about it, but there will be an opportunity tomorrow afternoon when the chair of our council and I host a World Cafe table, and we invite you to come along and tell us frankly what more we can do to, to help you. And uh, the council will be returning to that on the, the following day. The Council will then have to determine how that strategy is funded. We are very grateful to the University of Bologna for the financial and other help which it has provided. It's also grateful to those universities which have made voluntary donations to support its work in 2022 and 2023. Last year and this year, we have needed to draw on our reserves to fund our programme. And I hope, therefore, that you will be as generous as you can be when we write to ask for your help financially. We are currently one of the few associations that does not charge a joining fee or a membership subscription. And when the council has discussed this previously, that has been the position that it wants to maintain so that all universities who want to have access can have access. We would also welcome conversations with universities who would like to become more involved in our work, whether that's hosting one of our conferences or hosting some other activity or help in other ways. We are your network and you make it. Internally, we were very pleased to welcome the appointment of Julia during the year as our research assistant who, in addition to her research role, has added significant additional capacity and additional skills to our staff team of Carla and me. And Carla, I can't see you with all these lights, but we thank you most warmly for everything that you have done 
as we do Julia. Finally, I'd like to thank members of the Governing Council of the Magna Carta Observatory and members of its committee for all that they do for the observatory in an entirely voluntary capacity. Also, I'd like to thank all of you for all that you have done to support and enable the observatory to progress to this stage this year. Thank you in anticipation for your input to our future strategy and all that we hope you will do to enable us to realize our aim to enable universities to play an even greater role in society in these turbulent times and in the future. Thank you. And because of the richness of it, I'm now going to invite Gigit Zandana, the chair of our research committee, um, to say a few words about our research. And then Julia will come along and will share with you some of the activities that we've enjoyed during the year and over the last two days. Giga. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. David, thank you very much. I will continue with one particular topic which was briefly described by David in his speech already, that of responsibility. Uh, in 2020, a new updated version of the Magna Carta Universitatum, the great ch charter of universities, was published, which um, alongside with the traditional principles of academic freedom and institutional autonomy enshrined in the 1988 version of the document, mentions explicitly universities' contract with civil society as well as the principle of university responsibility. Um, when Magna Carta Observatory resolved to establish a research committee, it was decided that it would take as its major topic precisely the theme of responsibility, not to the detriment of the ideas of freedom and autonomy, but on the contrary, as the opportunity to rethink them against the backdrop of new challenges and in new contexts. I'm extremely glad that Julia Berroso, sitting right next to me, uh, who is the latest addition to the small but fiercely efficient administrative team of the MCO, will talk in detail about the activities undertaken within this framework by the research committee. And because of that, I will allow myself um, a little theoretical digression. As somebody who is interested in the history of ideas, I can tell you a thing which surprised me and could be surprising to you as well. In Europe, people started to use the language of responsibility only about 150 years ago. The word which we regard as indispensable for our moral vocabulary became familiar in modern European languages, English, German, French, I could only suppose it in Polish as well, around 1850s. Before the time, of course, there was an understanding of somebody being responsible for something, but in a very different sense. The old paradigm was that if something would go broke, somebody was to be found to blame for that. So this was the old concept of responsibility. The new, almost revolutionary sense of the term responsibility comes from the understanding of it as, in the first instance, self-responsibility. This understanding is based on the idea of autonomy and implies responsibility for things which one has not committed. This is precisely the meaning of the term which seems to be relevant in the context of university life. 
universities take responsibility for the problems, challenges, and sometimes disasters for which they are not to be blamed. To give you one uh, concrete and very topical example, as already mentioned by David, based on an open call, the research committee selected six partner universities, each of them reflecting on their institutional experience of societal engagement. Out of the six, three case studies deal with the responses of universities from three different countries to the crisis caused by the Russian invasion in Ukraine. The universities, certainly, these universities certainly were not responsible for this invasion, but they were compelled to respond in different ways to the humanitarian catastrophe caused by it. We at the research committee of the MCO are strongly interested what can be learned from such responses about the university, about how these decisions to engage are being made, about the results achieved through this kind of response, about, and about the ways it modifies our understanding, not just of the third mission of the university, but of the overall mission of the higher education. We understand very well that it is not easy for a complex institution such as university to respond consciously and deliberately to societal challenges. There are many reasons for that, some fairly general, unintended consequences of our own actions, or almost an a priori impossibility to predict the progress of science and technology on which the operations of the universities are based. These uncertainties make the decision to engage with society even more prize-worthy on the side of the universities, especially because these struggles and this, uh, are not only internal and moral in character, but they are very real forces outside of our institutions which do not want universities to get involved, to engage, and to meddle. I often say that I admire a slogan of a writer from the last century who came up with this um, um, motto, meddling is desirable. Meddling is a more prosaic word for more academic engagement or responsiveness. We know that this meddling, this engagement, often comes at a price. The dangers to the academic freedom most often are the result of um, the universities meddling into societal affairs. And we have seen this danger appear in the most unexpected places, not only where academic institutions are relatively new, but also, and surprisingly, where there have been a long and, and strong university traditions of institutional autonomy and academic freedom. All the more, I would like to thank all the involved in our efforts to think and rethink these issues around academic responsibility, the members of uh, the research committee, our university partners, project ambassadors who support our partner institutions. And I would like to underline how much we would welcome your interest in our projects and how much we look forward to collaborate with you in various activities we are undertaking or planning to undertake, of which Julia will tell us more. Thank you very much, and Julia, the floor is yours. You have to excuse me because that is actually my first time using a microphone, not even in a karaoke. So uh, let's see. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Giga. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I have to say that I am a very conventional and stereotypical researcher that is always on the back and hiding a bit, but I'm happy to be here and present our brilliant project for all of you. Uh, so, as Giga already presented, the topic 
that we have chose is the responsive and responsible university. And uh, I will start with uh, this quote that is directly from Magna Carta Universitatum, the version from 2020. Uh, universities acknowledge that they have a responsibility to engage with and respond to the aspirations and challenges of the world and to the communities they serve to benefit humanity and to contribute to sustainability. This is our starting point. It was our starting point for the research project, thinking and reflecting what is the role of the universities in the 21st century. So unfortunately, we have uh, many disasters, natural, man-made, and we have, the, the universities have the, the role and they have the capability to engage and to respond to these challenges. So we have three areas that we are working, uh, two with more focus. The first one is the project that Giga already mentioned. So, yeah, uh, okay, now it's working. Uh, so, three areas that we are focusing. The first is this project that is engaging directly with six universities. Um, and as Giga already presented, they are focused in different areas, but always with this challenge to respond to the communities the surrounding, and finally to benefit the common good. The second focus is the creation of a text repository. I will talk a little bit in more details, but it is a project with the purpose of sharing uh, the knowledge in the area of responsibility and also in the area of Magna Carta uh, actions, also academic freedom uh, and university autonomy. So we are also starting with some other uh, research initiatives. One of them uh, was starting, uh, it's actually starting today uh, from the the results of the essay competition, we also uh, imagine that it could be very important to engage the students in this um, building of uh, a new area of uh, action of Magna Carta and having them participating uh, in our research project. Uh, so the general objectives uh, for our research pro pro project is to increase awareness in this uh, area uh, of uh, social responsibility of universities, enhance the understanding of researchers, universities, students, develop framework and guidelines that can guide as universities, that can guide researchers and perhaps increase uh, the action of other universities that have not uh, yet started uh, giving back to the communities and to the surroundings and, and disseminate the research findings, not only from our research project, but also from other initiatives that are happening around the world. And we are also hoping to encourage and facilitate uh, these research initiatives that are taking place, and especially the ones that we are uh, co uh, collaborating with. So, uh, so I am now I'm going to focus specifically on the research project, directly uh, working with the universities. Our idea is to create a new uh, link, a completely different link uh, with the, the partners' universities. And we have observed that many universities are subscribing to our principles. We are having more and more universities signing up uh, Magna Carta, specifically the Magna Carta version 2020. But this uh, universities still uh, perceive as a challenge uh, and also have difficulties to put this uh, principle in practice in their teaching and their learning activities and their research strategies. So our idea is to 
somehow support this, uh, these universities and uh, encourage these initi initiatives. So as um, I'm going to, I think, show you this because then it gets more interesting. So this is our uh, research site. So these are the six first universities that are contributing with us and we are contributing with them. So we have finished this morning a very, very uh, interesting and engaging um, two-day uh, workshop. And the idea of this workshop was, uh, although this, not all these universities are talking about the same topic, about the same topic, they are they could collaborate and create a network among themselves. So we have uh, Vasilistus Donetsky National University from Ukraine with a project focused in um, the situation of uh, the universities displaced university, specifically uh, being one displaced university. And I have to apologize for the Polish, uh, yeah, I will, <laughs> medical university from Poland and Wrocław. <laughs> um, and uh, they are working also with a very, very brilliant and interesting project that is supporting uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, in this context of war. We have also working with a focus in Ukrainian refugees and uh, this uh, um, sense of creating a community and, and supporting the situation, Mikolas Homeris University from Lithuania. And finally, we have three other universities that are focusing on different projects, but also very interesting, very, very important. Uh, University of Tetova of North Macedonia is focused in uh, discussing bullying uh, and violence among students. Uh, Technical University from Dublin in Ireland is focusing on a more reflexive uh, project. They are a new university and they are building a new framework to focus and reflect on past projects um, that engage with the community in order to create a more uh, a uh, university that is more inclusive and also uh, builds uh, their work towards the community. And finally, the American International University from Bangladesh. They are uh, focusing on uh, empowering women and uh, building uh, living uh, areas that, that support uh, uh, poor communities. So. Now I go to our repository. So the purpose of our repository is to preserve, disseminate, organize, and store textual and audio files in topics related to the word of the work of the organization, namely university autonomy, freedom, uh, university responsiveness and responsibility, uh, produced not only in the scope of the organization, but also we are going to welcome uh, works from different authors and different universities. So we are inviting also you to contribute and collaborate with this, um, this uh, project. Uh, so the idea is that it's going to be an open access repository that is going to contribute to the values of Magna Carta Universitatum and support universities, researchers and students, and of course, in the end, all the community and, the, and promote the common good. Um, the idea is that knowledge should be shared, should be um, available, and support the, the, uh, the work of the universities and support the, the actions of them. Um, now a bit uh, short about details. We are using um, DSpace, an open source uh, software. This was a big challenge in the beginning. My background is in economics and international relations. And I have been learning a bit of programming to start setting up the initial uh, framework of our repository. 
And I have to say that it's easier to start learning this programming than being here at the moment. But um, uh, the idea is that these uh, materials that are going to be available are papers, conference conference papers, master thesis, videos, and also all the documents that we are going to produce in collaboration with the participant universities. A very, very important point for us is that the, this repository is not only going to have available materials in English, but also in other languages. It's very important that uh, everyone, independent of their language that they dominate, can, um, can access and can gain from this information. So maybe in the future we can also have inter-translations of documents that are in other languages. Uh, we also are going to prepare special filters to facilitate uh, the use of the database. And this, oh, sorry, this is the first look of the, the repository. Um, the name is uh, a reflection on uh, the role that we inspire to, to create uh, and also the logo, this idea of building together and growing and uh, somehow um, stimulating the change. And so here we are going to have different institutional publications and then all the publications uh, from different universities and with different uh, focus. So, finally, these are our contacts. Um, the email directly uh, from the MCO research, my email, our uh, social account, and we are going to try to also update all this information in, in the social account and uh, social media accounts and LinkedIn and hopefully uh, soon we are going to have our first uh, webinar that is related to this research project. So. Thank you, and yeah. <laughs>
and there's hardly anybody sitting here, I will know I've made a complete mess of giving you that information. But let me just say uh, a few words about the reception. Uh, we have a bit of a reputation at Magna Carta Observatory for doing slightly risky things in, in conferences. And one of them is our World Cafe session, but I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, the other slightly risky thing um, is the reception tonight. And it goes back to what I said about the generosity of signatories towards universities in Ukraine and the huge support from Poland for Ukraine. And we just thought that you might want the opportunity to talk to some of the people who come from those places to find out what it's really like firsthand. Now, to identify the people you want to talk to, you're going to have to look at their badges and their countries are written on them. Now, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't talk to each other or people from other countries or indeed ask us questions about what's been going on. But it's been a great joy to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you for your attention. We look forward to seeing you in the reception. Hope you get safely back on your buses and to meeting you here tomorrow morning. Thank you very much.